halfway through our time in confirmation, we had an activity to begin articulating our beliefs. We had to start putting our words, putting our beliefs into words. So for this activity that Steve Nash led, we had to write what we believed and then what we loved about the Holy Spirit. We struggled to find the words as a class, but there were lots of panicked faces. So we looked at this beautiful graphic that was in our curriculum, and then we had more questions. What is indwelling? How is the spirit with us? How can we feel the spirit? Is the spirit around all of the time? Yet right on this graphic is Pentecost and confirmation listed as two particular moments in the life of the church in which we recognize that the Holy Spirit is present. And today happens to be both of those days. It's on Pentecost, often called the birthday of the church, that we celebrate and remember the way the Holy Spirit came to be with the followers of Jesus, fulfilling the promise Jesus made that one would come after him as our advocate, a supporter for us. Someone would come and be our intercessor, one who intervenes on our behalf. The Spirit was to come as a friend, our companion, the one who teaches us everything and reminds us all of what Jesus told us. But it's a bit ironic how the first disciples of Jesus get to know the Spirit. Its arrival happens not how we think it should. The Spirit doesn't just show up like our own personal spiritual guide who answers all of our questions. No, instead, the Spirit comes like a violent, mighty wind surrounding those gathered people for the Festival of the Weeks, a celebration following Passover. And now in this gathering, there's this mighty wind that freaks out all those who are gathered because while no one understands what is happening, they understand one another for the very first time as they are speaking in one another's mother tongue the language the other first learned how to speak. I'd say that our confirmands in their class, we also know something about freaking out when trying to understand the Holy Spirit. Well, we found words enough to describe what the Holy Spirit means to us. Those in our class also realized that we could devote ourselves to Christ's teaching to the breaking of the bread, the fellowship, and the prayers of the people, even while being perplexed by the Holy Spirit that moves in ways we'll never fully understand, as we see in today's scripture. After the rush of wind, the tongues of flame appearing above people's heads, the communicating in one another's mother tongue and understanding each other, the people are perplexed. So they ask the question that comes naturally after witnessing and experiencing the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? It seems fitting that our confirmands profess their faith on this Sunday. The Sunday we acknowledge that we'll never have all of the answers about the Spirit. Rather, we'll ask just as those gathered on this day asked, what does this mean throughout our entire lifetime of faith? We'll ask, how does my faith shape the way I navigate this moment? We'll wonder if there's a reason. And while not everything will have a reason, you'll find meaning in God's relentless love for you, the way this love shapes your, how you live. And this is the good news you'll want to share with others. You'll continually live out your faith seeking understanding. And all of you know how to ask the question, what does this mean? Your willingness to ask this question is one of the things I admire most about you all as a group. You all have a faith in God unique to you, while also shared by all believers. And in your faith, you all, and those I know here at RCPC also, continue to seek understanding in their faith. You seek to know, for it's in that seeking that you catch glimpses of the divine, glimpses of the Spirit at work among you. I pray today that we all find comfort in realizing that the question our confirmands asked all semester is an old one, one asked over the last 2,000 years as the experience of the Holy Spirit has kept us all on our toes as we realize the Holy Spirit is inviting us to join one another. 
in this origin story of the Holy Spirit, the people gathered begin speaking in the mother tongue of one another. They speak one another's language. You all have started taking a language in school. You realize that in learning a new language, you have to begin by admitting you don't know anything. And then you begin to submit to the language for what it is. Difficult and different for you as it's not your own and also a language of love for another part of God's creation, as it's the language that others have been raised in, nurtured in, and loved in. The Holy Spirit, with its tongues of flame 2,000 years ago, invited those gathered to truly join one another in the way most authentic for them, in one another's native tongue. Acts 2 shows us the people's response to such a big invitation. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devote themselves to the community, to their shared meals, the breaking of the bread and the prayers. The Holy Spirit's invitation continues for us today, for we join one another not in the questions that we answer or in the faith statements like the ones our confirmands wrote, but we join one another in our devotion to God and in our devotion to one another. For our confirmands, you're answering that invitation today, beginning with the big questions you'll answer as you become active members within Raleigh Court Prez. But you'll all also realize that the Holy Spirit's invitation is a big one. It's not one just contained to the valley that we live in, but the invitation spills out and over into the whole world, inviting us to join one another. And while we know this task is difficult and different, we know it's one of love. There isn't much that I remember from my own confirmation experience, but here's me and my parents. I do remember a few stories here and there, which I've shared the confirm with the confirmands throughout the season. I can remember some of the people in my class, some I grew up with, and some only appeared at confirmation and then quickly disappeared. So I will take this moment to remind you all what I said a few weeks ago, that it will break my heart if I never see you after today. It will also break your mentors' hearts and I'll break everyone else in this whole room and who's watching online today who just can't wait to get to know you. So don't be those people. Tangent aside, what I do remember is are the ways that joining with these certain people in that certain place left a profound effect on my life. So this is Allison. She and I got each other through some of the bumpiest ups and downs of high school, all while going to different high schools. And then there's Alyssa. We didn't get along at all during confirmation. She actually fell in the mud on a retreat. My mom hand washed her clothes and Alyssa did not say thanks. And my mom was not exactly thrilled and I heard about it the whole way home. So uh, Alyssa knows the story's being told. Just <laughs> um, This is your reminder to say thank you to the adults who take you places and do things with and for you when they're not your parents and when they are your parents. And for the rest of us, saying thanks is a great thing to do. But even in Alyssa and I not getting along, we joined with one another. And a few years later, Alyssa grew up and, I went to the, and, and grew into one of the most genuine and generous spirits I know. And there's a whole other chapter of us growing up in the same church family that's filled with sleepovers and laughter and a whole bunch of love. Alyssa showed up to presbytery meetings for me. She would drive over an hour away at different times to support me on my journey to becoming a pastor. And soon we'll celebrate her wedding to a boy she met at church camp. You never know what the Holy Spirit is going to do. <laughs> you all, my confirmands, are joining with one another. You're joining the church all while you've joined each other in the season of confirmation. And as you join the church and 
I hope that you all know that you have one another as people you can count on and trust. As you join the church, devote yourselves to being trustworthy and dependable, especially to one another. I didn't see one of the kids in my confirmation class until graduate Sunday five years later, but there we struck up a good conversation. I learned that he was joining the Air Force so Kevin and I wrote letters while he was at basic training and I was in my first semester of college and getting mail was the most exciting thing to happen. I like to think that my name was a familiar name in his stack of letters, reminding him who he belonged to. This is us, our first Christmas after we graduated high school. To this day, it's a joy when we run into each other at home, whether it's at worship or out in the community. You, too, get to be the ones who remind one another who you belong to. You get to remind one another that you all belong to God on the good days and on the bad days and on all the days in between. It's in the joining that we see one another change. It's in the joining that we see the image of God in one another. It's in the joining when we devote ourselves to the fellowship and we practice belonging to one another that then we can remember we belong to one another outside of the church too. All of you spoke about the power of belonging with, within your faith statements, which are in the bulletin and are well worth reading in full. All of you see the beauty in belonging to a group of broken people who mess up but no, they have grace already offered to them, and so they try again. I'm reminded of Annalise's faith statement, in part because I got to sit with Annalise as she wrote part of hers, and she brought up the angels in the Christmas story, the messengers from God who bring comfort and remind Mary and us all, do not be afraid. I imagine those messengers could have been helpful in the first Pentecost, <laughs> But instead, they were left on their own. But while there might not be those angels around you, you'll find messengers of the message, do not be afraid, within this family of believers. There will be the difficult and the different in joining the church. And you'll also see the love. The love shown to you, the love you show others, and the love that reminds you that you are a beloved child of God. Confirmation is sort of an odd thing. We don't always do confirmation because it's what we want to do. Sometimes parents think their kids ought to, even though it's about their child making promises with God. But in my own experience, even for those confirmed at their parents' choice, God's relentless love pursues us. And if we're open to the Holy Spirit's invitation, it catches us. And we grow shaped by this love so that we can love all others. While I'm grateful to have heard from a few of you that confirmation was less boring than you feared, <laughs> my hope is that at the end of this, you know that God's love is for you. Keep following the Holy Spirit's nudge to join with God and with one another. In your joining, devote yourselves to God and to one another. Remember that you will never have any of this figured out, and neither will the rest of us. Instead, in your joining and in your devotion, may you exist both perplexed and in awe at how good our God is, just as those gathered on the day of Pentecost who witnessed the tongues of flame were so many years ago. Amen. <laughs>